one. We're uh, due to start now. So it's very nice to have you all with us this morning. For those who haven't uh, possibly attended a webinar before, just to give you a little bit of uh, information uh, about how this works. So the webinar will go for about an hour. It'll be a presentation by myself and I will be showing you a number of uh, slides as well. A copy of the slides and a certificate of attendance will be sent by our registration team to your registered email address following the presentation. The presentation will also be available um, as a video file, which you can get from the Aztec website if you would like to send it on to colleagues who have missed this or to anyone else. Your camera and microphones have been muted, so no one can see you, no one will hear you. If you do want to get a message to us or a question, please type it in the chat window. Make any comments you like there as we're going along. If it's a question, a member of our moderation team will highlight the question and add it to the Q&A section. And towards the end of the presentation, I'll go through all the questions and you'll be able to see the ones that our moderation team has highlighted. If you're having any technical issues, if you can't see me, if the slides are covering something, like at the moment, then just put a little message into the chat window and one of our friendly Aztec staff will contact you to let you know what's happening. So um, we have about 50 people uh, online today, I believe, and some of them will be uh, coming in, some will come in later, um, some will join as we're going along. But I'd like to welcome all of you and thank you for giving us your attention today. So sit back and relax, uh, get yourself a, a, a nice uh, cold drink or a cup of coffee or tea, whatever your uh, chai, whatever you're planning on uh, drinking while we're watching this. We have people joining us today from all over the world, uh, from Europe, the Middle East and Africa. So uh, welcome everyone. Uh, I'm in uh, the United Kingdom uh, and uh, the Aztec team are in Dubai. I hope everyone is safe and well and uh, I'm going to start the presentation now. So welcome everyone and uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you happen to be. <clears throat> so, um, the presentation that uh, we're going to be giving you today is about looking after your mental health and the mental health of your employees during this pandemic, but also what we'll be covering is relevant for any uh, traumatic uh, event or crisis. So. Let's think about what we're doing today. What are we going to be covering? Well, we're going to be looking at four areas. First of all, what is mental health? What is mental health? We're going to look at the impact of crisis on trauma on people, families, teams, organizations. We're going to look at how to look after your own mental health. And then we're going to be ending up talking about the value and the type of support services that can be made available for other people. So that's what we're going to be uh, covering uh, today. So let's start off by thinking about this question of just what is mental health? I want you to take a moment to think about that question. What would you think mental health is? I mean, it's an interesting question. Why do we call it mental health? And I guess 
the flip side to that coin is we think of physical health. So mental health as an idea is defined by the World Health Organization as a state of well-being in which every individual, every person, is realizes their own potential. They can cope with the normal stresses of life. They can work productively and fruitfully and is able to make a contribution to their community. That's what the WHO uh, tell us mental health is. But we have a fundamental problem here. I mean, let's be real here. We all know that in many countries, maybe your country, talking about mental health is uncomfortable. It's interesting that someone will quite happily, well, not happily, but they will quite uh, willingly tell somebody that they've contracted some sort of illness or they're feeling sick. But in many cases, there is a huge amount of stigma in telling people that you're feeling uh, down or that you're depressed or your mental health is not well. You know, it's a very interesting area. Now, when it comes to this balance between physical and mental health, this is a very, very, very difficult dichotomy because we're trying to suggest for a moment that somehow there is a difference. But in fact, there clearly is not. Our physical and our mental health are completely tied together. One leads to the other. And while there is a lot of stigma about mental health, particularly in some societies, this makes it very difficult for people to talk about. It makes it very difficult for people to even discuss the problems they're having. There's a few points that the World Health Organization make, and I would like to look at these. First of all, we all have a mental health. Every single person in the world today has a mental health, just like we have a physical health. And mental health is not just the absence of having a mental disorder. You know, just like our physical health, we don't say, well, my physical health is that I don't have diabetes, or I don't have cancer, or I don't have Ebola, or I don't have uh, gout. We don't say that. We just say, I'm feeling well. But when it comes to mental health, a lot of people seem to get caught up in the idea that it's about just the absence of having a mental disorder. This is not true at all. Our mental health is on a continuum. And that line goes from one end to the other. And we all are on that line and at different times during the day and during the week and during the year. Without mental health, there is no health. It's an integral part of our health. And this obsession with separating it out is a relatively new idea, uh, a very Western idea. In many Asian cultures, the integration between the mental and the physical is much more accepted. Our mental health is affected by a number of things socioeconomic, biological, environmental factors. These all have an impact on our mental health. And if our mental health is damaged in any way, or we want to protect our mental health or strengthen our mental health, there are many strategies to help us do that. So what we have here is a issue of mental health during a crisis. How does this affect us? Why does a crisis make any major difference? Well, let's take a moment to look at uh, some of the issues around uh, what is a crisis? What is a trauma? Well, according to a psychological definition, trauma occurs when one's assumptions that the world is benevolent and that the self is worthy, where these are challenged and a psychological crisis is induced. What we experience during crisis and trauma is injury to the person's inner world. Our core assumptions are shattered by the traumatic experience. 
Now, this type of trauma and crisis can involve many things. I've worked with trauma and crisis for the last 30 years. Some of whether it's been airline crashes or the earthquakes in China, bushfires, uh, people being involved in industrial accidents, death at work, uh, war, uh, terrorism. All of these situations can bring about trauma and crisis. And what we're going through at the moment, what the world is experiencing, is a global crisis. Every single person in the world today has been affected by what's happened. We are being affected um, in many different ways. And we'll look at what some of those impacts can be. But the most important thing to remember today, if you don't take anything else away from this webinar, is that whatever reaction you or your family or team members are having is a normal reaction to an abnormal event. What you're going through, whether it's fear, anger, apathy, tiredness, stress, is normal. These are normal reactions following a crisis or a trauma. Now, unfortunately, with this pandemic, we're experiencing multiple traumas. There's the trauma of the world being impacted. There's also the trauma of family members or yourself getting ill. There's death that's going to occur for thousands of people. That means that family members are going to be affected. The health professionals who are involved, the medical staff, emergency workers, even government officials who are handling the pandemic are going to be affected by this crisis. In fact, it would be very realistic to say that many people following this event, when it's all over, will likely experiencing a very particular type of stress that we call post-traumatic stress disorder. So this is a real possibility. So what we're experiencing now is definitely a crisis. It's definitely a trauma. But what are the outcomes? What happens when we experience psychological trauma or crisis? Well, here are some of the most common impacts. Now, anyone who's done a training course with me before will know that I talk a lot about how human beings are complex and it's very hard to give uh, an accurate indication of what one person will do in any circumstances because people are so complex. But in general, these are the outcomes that we often see, the psychological outcomes uh, of people who've experienced trauma and crisis. Sleep problems, worry and anxiety, feeling fatigue and lethargy. I was speaking to someone last night who told me that she's at home, self-isolating. She's had minor symptoms, but she's finding it really difficult even to get out of bed. She's finding herself not being able to do anything, even though she had great plans on what she would do with her 14 days of self-isolation. That's a normal reaction to crisis. Anger. Now, very importantly, this anger can be misdirected. Like me, you may have seen some of the videos online of people getting angry with other people in the streets and people shouting and screaming. And you've probably heard about people having uh, incidents in their home. This type of anger is normal, but it's often directed to someone else. Now, you can't really get angry at a virus. How do you get angry at the, uh, the virus? Uh, what do you do? So you get anger, angry at people who are close to you. Um, you also can have increased headaches. One of the problems is following crisis and trauma, we find excess smoking, drinking, and eating. Now, you may say, well, what's wrong with that? You know, if my coping mechanism, if the way I cope with life is that I like to have a drink or I like to smoke or I like to eat good food or junk food, whatever it might be, what's the problem? Well, there is a problem. And the problem is that these interventions of food, smoking, drinking, 
actually make your stress worse. They don't help you. Um, smoking, for example, is a stimulant drug. So even though we think it relaxes us, it actually has the opposite effect on our body. With the coronavirus, of course, we have very strong evidence that smoking, um, using shisha and so on, can actually make the condition worse for people who contract um, the disease. We've seen people excessively drinking. We've seen people who are drinking more than they normally would then causing other health problems. Panic attacks. Panic attacks is where people have what is almost like a heart attack to, the, to, to themselves. They can find it difficult breathing. They can find themselves not able to uh, um, stand up. They can find themselves feeling like uh, everything is, is collapsing around them. Anyway, all of these types of outcomes are a normal reaction. We have to be careful. We have to be looking after ourselves. But it's hard because getting back to what I said to you at the very beginning, we live in societies, and some of us live in societies where we don't talk about our mental health. It's embarrassing. No one wants to say anything. Let me share a very small story with you. I was speaking to a very senior manager several months ago before this happened. And he had been having problems in his life for many years. He eventually, after huge reluctance, went and saw a psychotherapist to get some uh, uh, clinical help. And he was diagnosed with a mental health problem. He went to tell his mother about this. And when he told his mother that he had a mental health issue, and this was a man in his 40s, his mother said that she was so embarrassed to hear that, that she didn't want to hear that that was the case. In fact, she would rather have heard that the man had experienced uh, some form of cancer. Because if he had had cancer, she could tell her friends, they could have a fundraising, they could wear little uh, plastic uh, uh, bracelets around. Uh, this was uh, normal. Mental health, on the other hand, was something that she was ashamed of in her son. This is an indication of how difficult it is for people to talk about mental health. Very, very hard. And because the last 20, 30 years, we've made it very difficult to talk about it, now when we're all experiencing an impact on our mental health, we now don't know how to talk about it. We don't know who to approach. We think that somehow our feelings are unique. And guess what? They aren't. They're not unique. Everyone in the world today, whether you've been directly affected, whether you're in a high incident area or a low incident area are being affected by this global trauma. It's affecting you. It's affecting your employees. So let's think. What can you do to look after your mental health during this time? What is open to you? Well, let me give you one of the big ones. Try to limit your use of new sites and social media. Look, I know it's very hard if you're stuck at home anyway, which many of you are. I'm, I'm here and I'm only allowed to leave once a day for exercise and, and so on. Um, for most of the people, you're finding yourself wanting to read online, looking at the stories in Facebook, following people on Twitter, uh, reading uh, new sites, but this is going to make things worse for many people. There is so much false information out there, conspiracy theories. I mean, goodness me, we have people burning down uh, 4G uh, radio towers in some uh, cities. Um, what we need to do is we need to be focusing very much on not getting too much information not spending all your time on social media and news sites, try to do other things. Netflix, videos, reading a good book, these are all great things to do. So try to limit, try to limit how much um, time you spend on social media and uh, on other forms of uh, internet. The other thing that I would say, 
and I've talked about this briefly, is try to talk about your fears and worries. Try to talk about those. Talk to somebody that you trust. Talk to somebody that you're close with. You may just find out that they're experiencing the same thing. Later in this webinar, I'll talk about what you need to do with your employees for those people on here who are managers or HR professionals. So talk about your fears and worries. Try to stay connected with other people. Now, it's difficult. We don't have physical connection at the moment uh, with family and friends and many people. Uh, we can't do the usual things uh, that we might do, going out to restaurants and hanging around malls or going to the cinema or the club or uh, gym, whatever it might be. But still try to stay connected with people wherever possible. If you can, use video conferencing, FaceTime, use Skype, use these types of programs so you can see other people. But guess what? Even talking on the phone to other people can be incredibly valuable. Point four, try to help and support other people. When we're experiencing problems or when we want to protect our mental health, helping other people, reaching out to other people, just small acts of kindness can make all the difference in the world. Where I live, I live in a country area, farming area, but uh, uh, nearby uh, there's, a, there's sort of... Uh, a small housing development and I heard from someone the other day who was saying that he simply posted on Facebook does anyone need help at the moment are they isolated do they need me to go to the shops pick up some things for them and he got a he got a message from an elderly lady uh, who said yes I, I so would like help she said it's hard for me to get out I'm really scared about going out because I walk so slowly if you could pick me up a few things for the shop it would make all the difference so he offered to help the lady guess what she lived across the road from him and she'd lived there for 40 years. He'd lived there for 10 years. He'd never met her, never talked to her. Now they're talking to each other on the phone every single day. He's doing shopping for her three or four times uh, a week, picking up little things for her, dropping things off for her, still keeping the social distancing. But both of them are getting something out of this. And what he said to me was he was amazed how much better it made him feel to help someone else. Look after your physical health and your sleep. If you can, keep to a routine. I know this is hard. I don't underestimate how difficult it is to look after your physical health when something like this is happening. Do your daily exercise. If you don't normally exercise, do it. Try to do your 5,000 or 10,000 steps, whatever you do each day. Watch one of the online um, exercise classes and join in. Do your yoga or stretching or whatever it might be. But also try to keep to a sleep routine. Set your alarm to wake up at a certain time each day and set another alarm to tell you to go back to sleep evening time. Don't find yourself forgetting about the clock. Try to keep to a routine. This will help you. Try to be careful that you stick to proper times for eating your meals. If you're stuck at home and self-isolating, it is very easy to get out of your daily routine. This is going to affect you. It actually affects you both physically and mentally. A lot of this has to do with a stress hormone called cortisone and other hormones that are floating around your body. So try to get what we call your circadian rhythms in line by keeping to a routine. Try not to set huge long-term goals at the moment. Just set short-term goals. What am I going to do today? What am I going to do tomorrow? This is not a time to be planning for the future. This is not a time to be making life-changing decisions as well. Many people during crisis and trauma find themselves thinking, oh, I should make a huge shift in my life. I should change everything. Let's redesign my entire life or my family's life. No. Set short-term goals. This will make you feel much, much better and it will protect your mental health. Do things you enjoy and keep your mind active. 
if you enjoy online gaming play some online gaming just if you find yourself online for 20 hours straight not healthy if you like to get online and play cards play chess if you want to play a computer game with other people i don't mind even if you're using fortnite you will find yourself um much better off if you do things that you enjoy keep your mind active so many organizations have made videos audio books libraries available during this time so download that audio book that you always wanted to listen to and take the time to listen read those books that you've bought or downloaded and never got around to but do things that you enjoy during this time keep your prayer meditation mindfulness exercises going there is clear evidence that during crisis and mental health uh, concerns that people who participate in regular prayer or meditation or mindfulness have better outcomes so consider what you do in your spiritual life our spiritual just like our mind and our body is all part of us the apps that are available to help you with things like mindfulness can really help you during this time if you can and if it's allowed i know my uh, colleagues in dubai have very strict restrictions and some of the other countries but if you can and it's allowed try to get outside at least once a day even if this is walking around the block even if it's standing in your backyard getting some sun on you actually helps our uh, hormones and the circadian rhythms but it also is healthy to get out if you're living in a tower block if you're living in a high rise try to go down have a little walk around outside this is going to help you and finally if you are experiencing major problems if there's crisis that you can't deal with if you find yourself with unwanted thoughts then get professional help we'll talk about professional help at the end but remember seeking professional help for mental health issues is absolutely no different than seeking medical help for a medical concern if you cut your leg and you couldn't stop the bleeding if you had a pain in your back which was not going away you would go and see a doctor if you're having problems which seem abnormal to you or if you just want to have a quick checkup talk to a mental health professional i just want to take a moment to pause and say to you that if you have any questions please type them in the chat window and i will get to the questions uh, by the end of the presentation now one of the things that's really concerned me, and I didn't cover this, this is a repeat uh, presentation. We did the first one of these last week and there was a lot of people asked to see it again. Uh, but in the first presentation, I didn't mention this because it's something that's happened since, but it's actually a very important uh, issue. And it has to do with some of the stuff that's happening on social media and people that are posting. And I wanna talk about this. And it has to do with this idea that you should feel like you should be doing something you should be productive during the lockdown and the harry potter uh, author jk rowling she tweeted uh, this week and condemned these so-called life coaches who are pressuring people to be productive during the lockdown and she's quite right i mean this is a really important point and what she said in one of her, her tweets and i want to share it with you if you haven't seen it is allowing ourselves to feel what we feel and acknowledging that we have good reason to feel that way is a better route back to good mental health than beating ourselves up for not being superhuman. Hear, hear, JK Rowling. This is a really important point. You know, Many people feel pressure on them at the moment. I've been reading tweets where people have been saying, oh, I'm writing the book that I never, want, I never thought I could write, or I'm reorganizing my house, where the reality is for 99% of people, this is a terrible situation. We feel awful. 
for people they've got potentially they're stuck in a house with their children all day long trying to work trying to do other things people are trying to cope with wondering if they're ill or sick they're trying to deal with all the impacts uh, that's happening in their life and then what we see is that we have some people on the internet telling us oh we should be being productive we should be uh, doing more with ourselves at this time please go away that is not at all helpful advice what is helpful advice is to deal with the issue that uh, to deal with it as jk rowling said and acknowledge that we have a good reason to feel the way we do at the moment if you're feeling bad if you're feeling stressed if you're feeling you can't cope this is a normal reaction to an abnormal event by the way the people who are trying to pretend that everything is fine and we shouldn't be worried and let's not care those are the people who are not fine those are the people who need to really seriously ask themselves you know are they being honest to themselves and other people around them this is not a time for as the british say the stiff upper lip this is a time to acknowledge that we're all in crisis we're all experiencing something that for most of us we've not experienced in our lifetime so be gentle on yourself be aware that what you're experiencing is not only normal it should be expected that these things would be happening to you so let's look at some of the hot spots some of the things that can make things even worse for some of us let's have a look at these here's a slide there's six of them that i want to talk about the first is that for many people their normal coping mechanisms have been cancelled for many of us in our life we do things that allow us to cope that could be going to the gym for example i'm sure you all know somebody who potentially goes to the gym every day after work for two or three hours these so-called gym junkies do that because it makes them feel better it's a way of coping what's going in, on in their life maybe the way you cope is going to a club or a pub maybe it's doing your gardening maybe it's meeting with friends maybe it's going for a shisha whatever it might be this has been cancelled you can't do it anymore and this is going to mean that your normal coping mechanisms have been taken away and that can make things worse be aware of that and think about the tips I gave before. I want to talk about number two because it's a very interesting point that some of you might not be familiar with. And that is that those people who have had previous trauma are now being what we psychologists call triggered. I first saw this many years ago. I was working in a, a psychological uh, workplace psychological center in australia and at the time uh, lady diana had been killed in the car accident some of you might remember that along with uh, jody uh, uh, her, her partner at the time and and some other people now being chased by paparazzi through the tunnels of paris now what was really interesting after the lady diana death was that huge numbers of people worldwide were finding themselves crying, being upset uncontrollably. In Australia, which is many miles away from London and Lady Diana, there were people who were unable to go to work, people who found themselves crying uncontrollably. And at the time, uh, uh, myself and the chief psychologist at my organization, we were very interested in what was going on. And what we realized, of course, is that when a trauma happens it often links to people's previous traumas in this case the lady diana incident allowed people to connect to feelings that they weren't allowed to have before i remember talking to a woman who was a vice president of a multinational company and she said she was finding herself crying uncontrollably couldn't stop finding herself having grief that she'd not experienced before. But when she went to see a psychotherapist, she realized that this was all about the death of her brother in front of her when she was a young girl, that she'd actually witnessed her young brother being killed in a car accident, but had never cried about it. She wasn't allowed to go to the funeral, 
never was allowed to talk about it in her family. But the Lady Diana incident not only brought things up, but gave her an excuse to have those feelings that she wasn't allowed to have. Everyone else is crying. So even as a powerful businesswoman, I can cry. Last night on the radio here in the UK, I heard a man saying that he found himself crying when he heard that Boris Johnson had been admitted to hospital, to intensive care. He said he didn't even like Boris that much, but he found himself crying. Now, what was going on there was almost certainly a previous trauma that was coming up. So if you've gone through things in the past, be it child abuse, uh, be it uh, if you were involved in the tsunami, earthquakes, bushfires, then the trauma that you had then will now be resurfacing. This is normal, but it means that you should seek professional help to talk about it. The other thing, of course, is that people are experiencing financial crisis and hardship. Many people can't work. Many people are finding their normal job is no longer there. Now, in some countries, governments are helping some people, not helping everyone. In some countries, they aren't. Many people are going to be experiencing financial crisis and hardship because, like many people in planet Earth, they have enough money to live for a couple of weeks. But once that runs out, what are they going to do? So we're going to see increasingly people with crisis and hardship. If you have employees, remember that all the first three things I've just mentioned will be happening to your employees. People are going to be using more alcohol and other drugs at this time. On one of the forums last night, I saw somebody posting how he was desperate to get some shisha and was asking, this was in Dubai, and could he have it home delivered? And he didn't care what he had to pay um, because he couldn't stand. You know, he needed it. He needed his shisha. We're finding that people are increasing during these incidents. They're increasing the amount they smoke, vape. And this is going to have a negative impact on their mental health, their physical health. And if they contract the virus, we know from very good but limited research coming out of what happened in China, that this can actually impact on people getting better from the virus. It's very sad that during all times, people experience domestic violence and abuse. But now people have less coping mechanisms, their stress has increased, some people are locked down with their abusers. It's a terrible thing, but the services that provide assistance for domestic abuse, child abuse, are being inundated worldwide. I spoke to someone who's running a, a child abuse service in Africa, in one of the African countries, and she's telling me that her, her calls have gone up by 700% in the last two weeks by people trying to contact. This is a problem. This is caused not only by the stress of lockdown, but people not being able to get out. And finally, I want to mention online gambling. Gambling can be an addiction for a percentage of people who gamble. It's very sad that during times of crisis, you have people who try to make money out of crisis. You know, we've all seen the people who are trying to uh, price gouge on face masks and hand sanitizers or even toilet paper. Shameful as that is, it gets worse. People are running scams at the moment about testing and running scams about trying to get help and collecting money for charities. But one of the legal scams is online gambling. I've noticed myself that I'm getting more messages, more emails, more ads on uh, social media about the uh, online gambling that's available. And guess what? During these times, people will find themselves gambling when they haven't normally. And this can add to their financial crisis and hardship. I mean, remember, gambling is always a way of making the company running the gambling more profitable. It's not going to be a solution to your problem. But you can see why people might turn to that. It's a way out. It's a way of dealing with problems. And there are other hot points, which are regional, which are cultural, which affect just your employees. So we need to think about these issues. We need to think about the hot points. But 
I've talked a bit about ourselves. I think the interesting question for us now is how do we know if someone is experiencing a mental health problem? You know, physical health is much easier to diagnose. I mean, it's not always easy. Sometimes people have conditions, physical conditions, and you don't see them. Some cancers, some internal uh, uh, diseases. But if someone is lost a lot of weight or they've gained a lot of weight or they're not walking properly or they can't exercise or can't move their arm, we, we see that. And they can get diagnosed fairly easy. But when it comes to mental health, it's much harder. So how do we... Um, how do we know? What are some of the things we should be looking at? Well, let me take a moment now to tell you 100% only a trained professional can diagnose someone. And this is a strong and important point. I'll even highlight it <laughs> if that's working. Um, only trained people can diagnose. Do not attempt to diagnose yourself. Do not attempt to diagnose other people. Please, please do not go to the websites where you type in symptoms and it'll tell you what your mental health condition is. This is ridiculous and unhelpful. So first of all, only trained professionals can diagnose other people. However, if you are concerned about people close to you, family, employees, colleagues. If you notice a change in someone's mood, behavior, habits, or personality, I want you to consider that mental health could be a possible reason. I say a possible reason because that's all it is. It's a possible reason. But we need to open our mind here to not just look at the physical. So open your mind to the fact that many people have mental health problems. In fact, one in two of us are going to be affected by mental health issues during our lifetime that are severe. One in three of us may have a diagnosed mental health issue. In fact, most people living with mental health issues are in the workplace. And they you may not even be aware of what's going on around you. Because remember, people don't talk about this. But remember that everyone is different and people will show very different symptoms, which makes it very hard to diagnose. One of the most valuable things you can do is to learn to talk and listen effectively. Using techniques like active listening, using techniques that you may have learned on courses to do with communication, these are all incredibly valuable at this time. Listening to someone is one of the most powerful things that you can do. And just as a small point, I want to remind you of something we call the 70, 30, it's hard to draw on these screens, 70, 30 rule. Now, what is the 70, 30 rule? Well, the 70, 30 rule says that when you're talking to someone, you should be listening 70% of the time and talking only 30. Most of us get this wrong. In fact, when we do research and look at families who are having problems, often the parents who say they can't talk to their kids, you find that they're doing all the talking, not doing any listening. Same happens to managers and employees. We need to be listening 70% of the time talking 30, the person we're trying to help needs to be talking 70% of the time and only listening 30. You actually can't listen and talk at the same time. So learning to close your mouth and listen is one of the most powerful things you can do. And by the way, listening is a wonderful thing you can do for another person. I also want to mention, though, at this stage, that many organizations in the world have been starting to do what we call mental health first aid. Now, we all know what first aid is. Some of you may be first aiders. If you're a first aider, you don't go in and treat someone's illness 
what you do as a first aider is reassure them, assess, and then get them professional help if it's needed, call an ambulance or send them to the uh, first aid clinic, pardon me. Mental health first aid is exactly the same. You select a group of people in your organization, 10 or 15 in a, in a company of three or 400. It might be a few dozen in a larger organization and you put them through training for a day and they become mental health first aiders. You have to be very careful about the people you choose. These people should be people who are good listeners, who have compassion, but also people who are willing to know their own limitations. But this mental health first aid training is something that we find incredibly valuable. If you have that in place now, your mental health first aiders could be the first point of contact for your employees who may be worried about what they're experiencing. At Aztec, we run uh, a online course uh, now, <laughs> obviously, uh, which is one day uh, to train up mental health first aiders. Some of you listening to this or some people you know may be interested in running that course in-house, online, or attending a public course. Let us know if you are interested. And during that one day, we, we teach them some of the stuff I've covered today, but we go into a much more detail on issues around mental health and what could be the first steps you can do. So it's called mental health first aid. Now, I want to show you a slide, which is really the getting close to the last slide I'm going to show, penultimate slide about getting help. I can see there's a couple of questions about supporting people and what you can do. Well, first of all, psychological interventions like counseling and psychotherapy are incredibly powerful ways of helping people. Psychology works, counseling works. Online counseling, which is available now because people can't go and see face-to-face, -face, has been shown to be almost 95% as effective as face-to-face -face if it's done by professionals who are well-trained. So getting help is one way. But I wanna talk about employers for a moment. And I wanna talk about what we call EAPs, Employee Assistance Programs. Of the Fortune 500 companies, the top 500 companies in the world today, all of them, 100% of the Fortune 500 companies have EAPs in place. An employee assistance program provides free, professional, confidential counseling to all your employees and members of the family. It offers face-to-face, -face, telephone, online counseling and support services. It's paid for by the employer and the employee accesses it just like they access the physical health service. These programs are available in over 100 countries. In fact, in the GCC, in almost every country in Africa, Europe and the Americas, these EAPs are available. If you want more information on those, I recommend going to uh, the Employee Assistance Professionals Association, E-A-P-A, -A, and there's an EPA in each continent, each area of the world, and they can give you information uh, or you can read information on how to set one of these up if you don't already have these in place. Uh, an EAP has been shown to be incredibly effective during all times, but when there's a crisis and trauma, you can simply activate, remind your employees that it's available. If your company is a multinational organization, you may find you already have an EAP in place, just no one's really been aware of it. I was talking to a manager from a shipping company just two weeks ago, and we were talking about getting help for his employees when they're at home and struggling with mental health issues. And I said, I said, do you have an EAP? He says, I don't think so. What's that? I told it. He said, no. He went and checked with occupational health. He got back to me and he said, guess what? We have an EAP. In fact, we've had it for 10 years. No one in our region has ever used it. He says, but I'm going to now make sure everyone has sent information. So find out if you have an EAP in place. If you don't, set one up. Support. 
Support can be family, social services, mental health teams, religious support from mosques and churches, synagogues. This can help you. So getting help. Other practical interventions. Helping people with their housing, finance, legal can make all the difference in the world. You know, companies that do things well are going to be remembered after this is over. It's not what my talk's about today. I've written a bit about this, but it's very interesting that there are companies out there, and I'm not going to mention them, but there are companies out there that have done really terrible things to their employees during this crisis. There are others that have looked up after their people incredibly well, who have done really serious assistance financially, legally, maybe even through an EAP, but what I'm really talking about now is reassuring people about their job, reassuring them about their accommodation, reassuring them about their future. This is the time to shine as a manager. This is a time to shine as a company owner. And guess what? People are going to remember this forever. I remember when I was involved in a crisis once that happened in an organization where there'd been an employee suicide in, in the factory floor in front of everyone. And the employer went beyond themselves to provide mental health support to all the employees, families, everyone. They did 10 times more than they even would have needed to do legally or morally. But guess what? That organization, when we went back and studied them for two years later, we found that they had the best retention some of the most in, engaged workforce. And the one thing that people always mentioned was how the company looked after them in the time of crisis. So don't forget what you do now will be remembered. Treat your employees as you would like to be treated. Make yourself a model employer. Lifestyle changes, help your mental health, exercise, diet, Restricting your alcohol and drug use. Social and recreational activities can all help our mental health. Of course, many of that is limited because of the lockdown. And finally, sometimes for some mental health disorders, medical intervention such as medication may be what people need, but that can only be diagnosed by a, quality, quali a qualified clinical psychologist or psychiatrist. Before I get to the questions, I want to put up my final slide, which is really something that I'm sure you've all potentially seen before. But this is a quote from a ancient Islamic writer, goes back many hundreds of years. And the quote translated to English in the 1850s, the first time we saw it, said, this too shall pass. This too shall pass. What we're going through at the moment will be over. Is it going to be 12 weeks, 12 months? We don't know. No one knows. This is a unique situation, but it will pass. But the impact on people, in many cases, won't pass right away. They're going to need assistance. They're going to need mental health intervention. You as an employer, as a manager, the way you handle things now, will also be remembered. But this too shall pass. What I'd like to do now is to take a moment to go to the Q&A mode and to see about uh, answering some of the questions. So the first question uh, from Bisma, uh, the previous, if you mean my previous session, it was basically a repeat of this, although each web webinar is slightly different. <laughs> um, there was a session with my good colleague, uh, Gerald Bradley, uh, on Monday, and uh, he gave a presentation on uh, um, uh, being motivated uh, and a successful uh, person uh, and uh, keeping your uh, uh, spirits up uh, during this time. Uh, very good webinar. And you'll see we have other webinars planned, one for Friday and one for next week. How do we keep employees productive in the face of crisis? Well, the first thing I would say uh, to answer that very good question, uh, let me uh, publish it. Let me see. How can we? I think if I click that, you can all see it now. <laughs> um, uh, 
how do we keep employees productive? Well, first of all, I think it's important to reassess your productivity expectations. Can we expect the same from people now that we expected before? In many cases, the answer is no. But what you don't want to do is take your finger off the pulse of what's going on. In fact, as much routine as you can offer people, the better. Not so much as a distraction, but as a routine. And routine helps mental health. So it's hard because here in the UK, if you want to get government assistance, you have to furlough your employees and the government covers 80% of the salary. But those employees are not allowed to do any work at all or you don't get the money. So those employees are effectively told to stay home and do nothing. Now, while financially that helps them, mentally, the mental health is going to be affected because they have boredom, nothing to do. Those employees should be told about mental health resources, maybe show them videos like this one. Um, feel free to link to this video. But, and there are many others out there, and many services available uh, for mental health at the moment. But for the employees who are working, it's important to make sure that your managers understand how to manage a remote workforce, for example, understand how to ru run remote meetings, understand about um, how people work from home. You know, I've been talking about home working for 25 years, and one of my colleagues in a university in Australia, he was, he was joking the other day that I gave a huge speech on home working uh, in 1989 at a big conference, and I talked about how by the year 2000, uh, maybe 30, 40% of the workforce would be working from home. I was clearly wrong. Um, but it's interesting now that many employers are experimenting with home working. What I do recommend is that HR people start some research at this time to see how it's working. What are the problems? What are the difficulties? How can you improve? Um, now, we've got another question here. How can we, uh, how could the COVID crisis uh, impact people Children's mental health, yeah, absolutely. There is no doubt that your children are affected and we might even run a webinar on this at some stage, but uh, um, the first thing I would say, and I only have so much time here, but I would, I would certainly say, talk to your children about what's going on. Do not try to cover it up. Do not try to give them some fake story about what's happening. Children do have a lot of resilience and they can handle crisis and trauma. It was interesting that when I was working on the, uh, the earthquakes in China that affected millions of people, we often found that the children were the ones who were coping better than their parents. But this is not to say that children can't be affected. They're going to pick up the stress and trauma that's coming from their family members and particularly from their parents. Uh, many children aren't able to do their usual routine, play with friends, go out, go to school even. Um, so absolutely, it's having an issue. Watch, monitor, talk. Talk and listen to your children. Um, here's another question. Uh, how do we um, get the general manager to expect high productivity. Yeah, I mean, I think the trouble for many senior managers is that they don't fully understand the impact of a global crisis and trauma such as this. It's not surprising that many general managers or owners or businesses may feel that they expect a lot from their people during this time, particularly if they've kept them in work and not laid them off. You know, this is again normal during huge disasters during the tsunamis in Southeast Asia, during bushfires in Australia, we actually found many managers were saying, why are my people not working as hard? You know, what's the reason? Why are they all sitting around uh, feeling depressed and sad? It's incredibly important that your senior managers get proper coaching and advice um, during this time. It's important that they educate themselves about these issues, particularly if they come from a technical background where they may not be familiar with these more human factors. How can we employ, encourage employees to attend online training? Well, very good question. Um, 
for my, the training professionals on here in HR people. You have a training budget. You don't spend it. In many cases, it's going to be cut back next year. So you need to be thinking about that. Who knows when we can do face-to-face -face training again? And we know a lot of people love face-to-face -face training. They love going to other cities, Dubai, London, uh, whatever it might be. They like the interaction with other people. And online training doesn't feel the same. But it's important to let people know that their career development has not been put on hold. That actually during this time, running online courses, whether it's an in-house course or a public course, can be a great way of them still feeling energized and engaged and still seeing life after the virus. So here at Aztec, we're going to be running a series of one and two day courses, uh, which can be run online, public courses. They'll be similar to this, but the difference will be people's cameras will be turned on and their, their microphones. And so they'll be participating, we'll have activities and workbooks and things that people can work through. And actually I've been doing online training and teaching uh, at universities and others for 20 years now. And while it has limitations, it also has other advantages, certainly has cost advantages. But during this time, I think it's vital that you don't abandon all of your training efforts. Keep your people engaged. An online training course for a day with, say, your team on something that's important could be a very valuable way of engaging, motivating, and keeping them interested. Um, someone's asked about the EAP. The EAP is normally uh, run through the HR department. Although in some companies, it can be run through occupational health or medical. Um, so about 80% of companies run it out of their HR department, the other 20 through medical or occupational health. In the oil and gas industries that tend to be very safety orientated, they often do their EAP through the safety services, um, but they're very uh, valuable. So the issue of training has come up again by someone else who's asked about, yeah, I think that your training budget is a real issue. Um, I think that maybe for training professionals, we need to look at uh, maybe doing a webinar just particularly on that issue about online training and the value of it. Uh, it's a really good uh, question and one I don't have time to answer now, but maybe we could do a webinar in a couple of weeks time on that topic for training professionals about online training, what's available, the advantages, the disadvantages, how you evaluate it. But I strongly recommend for all the reasons I've said to still continue with your online uh, training activities. This is not a time to just have everything on hold. And by the way, um, to use an example, Two years ago, for one of our clients, I ran training during Ramadan. It was actually in Oman. And I remember at the time, it was unusual during Ramadan. People often don't uh, do training. But this training manager in this particular organization thought, well, we have a lot of people. We're not, it was a factory. They weren't very busy during that time. People are not working long hours. So she said, why don't we run a course each day? We'll do a five-day course four hours a day. But in fact, the course will be a course that would be normally a three-day course, but we'll spread it over five days. And people got a huge amount out of that course. In fact, I remember fasting with the people who were doing it, and uh, it was a very interesting experience for myself. But one of the great things that came out of that was that they were using a time which often would have been, and she told me, the training manager told me, that often people would be sitting around, there wouldn't be much happening. But having them attend training for a week, four hours a day with breaks, was actually incredibly valuable. It kept people still engaged, motivated. So I think during this time, running online training is very valuable. Um, how do you carry out a headcount assessment without being inhumane? Uh, I'm not sure Samantha's question. Um, maybe, Samantha, if you could just give me a little bit more information. Um, and uh, help, how do I help somebody? Well, we've covered a bit of that on how to help people, but be a listener. Don't be scared to talk to your employees. If you're a manager, checking in with your team on a regular basis, if they're working at home, it is totally acceptable to raise the issue of mental health. You know, one way to broach the subject 
particularly if you come from a culture where these things are difficult, is I would recommend sending them a link to a video such as this. Uh, they can watch this webinar. And then you could have a little meeting with your team and say, well, what do you think about what that psychologist, Tony Bond from Aztec had to say? Do you think you agree? How's that affecting you? This would be a very valuable way of uh, importing, uh, sorry, uh, letting people know that it's uh, certainly okay to talk about these issues in your team or in your organization. So let's see if there's any other questions. We're getting towards the end. So remember everyone, you will be sent a certificate from Aztec for attending this, and you'll also be sent a copy of the slides that I put up on the screen. So thank you all for joining in. Please look after your own mental health. Look after the mental health of your employees. But if you take away one thing from this webinar, please take away the point that what's ever happening to you or your employees is a normal reaction to an abnormal event. Thank you, everyone. It was very nice to see you. I think I got to most of the questions. If you have any other questions and you want to contact us, just send an email to Aztec and they'll forward it on to me and we'll answer those for you by email. Or if you'd like more information about anything that I've covered, please uh, feel free to contact us. Um, I also will let you know that we have a number of other sessions that are going to be uh, run, a number of other webinars uh, webinars by distinguished colleagues of mine. I think uh, Professor Leonard Jung is going to be running a very interesting one uh, uh, in, a, in a couple of days' time. And uh, you, I strongly recommend uh, looking at those. Um, and thank you, everyone. Uh, keep well, keep safe, and remember what I said, this too shall pass. Bye, everyone.